Welcome to Minority Trip Report. MTR is a podcast spotlighting stories of personal transformation and underrepresented leaders in mental health, psychedelics, and consciousness. I'm your host, Raj Saraj. If you're learning from or enjoying Minority Trip Report, please subscribe to MTR on YouTube at Minority Trip Report and follow us on Instagram at Minority Trip. Thank you and enjoy the episode. Today, my guest is Nikita Singhal. Nikita is a fourth-year psychiatry resident at the University of Toronto who completed her undergraduate degree and medical training at McMaster University. She is passionate about engaging in advocacy work, empowering individuals with lived experience, and contributing to medical education. Nikita hopes to combine her clinical interests in addictions, eating disorders, and psychedelic assisted therapy to work with underserved and marginalized youth. Nikita, welcome. Thanks so much for having me. This is very exciting to, to have this conversation with you, not only because I think you're a very inspiring individual, and I've read a number of interviews now about your work and what you're hoping to do. I think it's super inspiring uh, and really courageous. But not only that, I think your lived experience itself can shed a lot of light in, into what feels like to me as somebody who's never experienced it, the hidden world of eating disorders and what the experience itself is like. And so it's going to be really helpful for our audience and even for me to understand and maybe then assist others around us who may be experiencing these struggles that we don't know about. Um, and at the flip side of that, compulsive behaviors or addictions and things like that are also generally quite mysterious. I don't think we understand enough about them. So never mind how to treat them effectively in a wholesome way. So I'm really excited about this conversation. Before we get into the work that you're doing now, I'd love to know a little bit about your most formative memories and feel free to start wherever. I often find it's really helpful to understand the setting setting in which somebody grew up, their relationship with their parents, how their parents came to be. A lot of my guests are immigrants, so their parents' experiences are quite formative and, and influential because from, from our parents' experiences, do we gain sort of the value set that we further live our life by. All to say, let's start when you are much younger. What were your first formative memories like? That's an interesting question. I think up until probably a couple of years ago, I would have said I just genuinely don't really remember anything probably pre-age 10 or so. And it was more like my parents would tell me things that happened or I knew things happened, but it wasn't really like I remembered it. It was just like having a story told to me. Recently, though, as and as I've gone through a lot of this, like my own personal journey, I have started to have little bits and pieces. But I guess so one of the places I generally start or can point things back to would be when I was around seven years old. That was when first I guess my parents noticed something was off or wrong and at the time, I guess I could go even back a little bit further. So my parents are divorced. They divorced when I was probably two. So I don't really remember much from that time at all. But we were actually, they're, they're both Canadian. So my mom came to Canada, she was born in Fiji, but came when she was quite young. And my dad was born in India, but then came, he's actually out east in, in Fredericton, New Brunswick. So they both grew up in Canada and they, were living in Canada and it was just happened to be that my dad was working in San Diego at the time when I was born. So I, I really had no idea about any of this until much later, like probably in my teen years, but it was quite an, a, I guess, a interesting divorce. It was basically my dad has bipolar disorder. And at that time he was going through his own struggles and he actually, I think was in manic episode and then afterwards in a depression and so there, all of this was going on at the time I was like an oblivious toddler but that was basically what happened around the time of the divorce my mom ended up coming back with me back to Toronto and I lived with her with my grandparents so her mom and dad and my dad I think he came back to Canada as well he stayed back with his parents out east and he did get help and when I was younger, I would see him. He traveled a lot for work as well. So I'd see him probably once every few months initially. And then we had this routine of like once a week. And that was the drill. I didn't know any differently. It was just, I live with my mom. I see my dad once a week. We hang out and we would always do fun things like go to the movies. And uh, yeah, that was basically me. Around age seven, oh, my 
grandfather. So my mom's dad had passed away recently. My mom ended up getting remarried. But it's like looking back, these are some of the things that different treatment providers I saw said, oh, maybe that's what was going on. That was what precipitated all of this. At the end of the day, I still don't really know. But Mm. I started acting differently. It was it was different things. Like I was like tapping things. I was like hitting myself. I did decide I just didn't really want to eat much anymore. And I was never like much of an eater. And I wasn't like I guess I was on the smaller side as a kid. So then when I stopped eating, and then it wasn't like sticking on the growth curve, and I was falling. And then my pedi- my doctor sent me to a pediatrician who sent me to sick kids just for an initial assessment. And back then, I guess this was like 20 years ago, wasn't as common for kids that young to be diagnosed with eating disorders. So anyway, went to sick kids for that initial assessment and they decided right then and there to admit me to the hospital. And that was where all of this kicked off. I was very stubborn and they sat down and played food in front of me. And I think back all the time, what if I had just eaten whatever it was like macaroni and cheese. I was like, what if I just ate it? So it would have happened. But I refused. And so that was like my first time being admitted to the hospital. It was five weeks. It was pretty, like a pretty terrifying experience. Just because, again, most of the people there, they were teenagers. There was a lot of very ill people, a lot of eating tubes. There were people in like restraints at times. And it was just Mm. not yeah I think and again maybe this is why a lot of it I don't really remember might have blocked it out but ever since then it was I was in the treatment system and I don't know that it was about food initially or it was I was just really anxious and I had obsessive compulsive disorder and I also had this behavior around not wanting to eat and then it, it definitely did do and like a full-blown eating disorder I was very fixated on then they wanted me to gain weight and it was not, it became about always about food. Weight. And, and that that first time, actually, my parents, my mom and my stepdad, they ended up pulling me out, I guess they call it, against medical advice because they just didn't really understand why they kept pushing. They wanted me to be on like the normal BMI, even though I had never been an average weight. And so it's a bit they had to agree to put me in the outpatient treatment. And they actually, I'm thinking back now, and I know at the time I was just mad at, at ever. I was mad at the treatment for I was mad at my parents for doing this to me. Like it was all very self-centered as a kid. But I can see now with my parents, like my mom, like I know they threatened to call Trump's and wanted to take me out of the hospital. So yeah, it was a bit of a whirlwind at that time. But sorry, I know I rambled on a lot. That's where this all started, if like, gives a bit of a picture. No, thank you for sharing that. I can imagine how traumatic that might have been, not only in the sense of being disoriented in that space, but to see other kids and young teenagers of being treated in that way. What sounds like to me was violent, even if the intention was there to help them. I often feel like, how can it be that was helpful? And I, uh, yeah, I know, like, looking back, I can, people are doing the best with what they have at the time. And that's what was reinforced in treatment. It was like the force feeding. And it's very, even now, like 20 years later, unfortunately, I don't think much has changed. And that emphasis is really on weight restoring. And I just remember, like, other times, like, when I had been admitted and come out again, like, even the people working there know it's not working. Like mm. I know one of the nurses told me it was like a revolving door and it just, I guess there was like a lack of any other way to do things. Yeah. I feel like you have to do something, even though that something is ineffective or wrong. It's something. So I guess the immediate question in, in, in sort of the experience that you described is when you say you didn't want to eat, how does that feel in your body because I imagine most of us think that hey when you're hungry the only thing you want to do is eat to eat something because your body's craving food describe to me what it is is it because you don't feel hungry or the idea of eating or putting something in your mouth to chew is revolting what exactly is it like and this is where it's probably different I can only really speak to my experience Mm -hmm. with it but I honestly cannot remember liking 
food ever. And maybe it came from that starting place where it was like food was punishment. It was like, oh, you're moving, like you're actually, okay, we're going to give you like extra food. And so all I can remember is like hating food. And it was this thing that was forced on me. And I don't know, like I, for me, yes. And this is another thing, I guess, is not too uncommon with eating disorders is that those hunger cues are disrupted. And at least growing up, I was maintained, I was forced that by my parents as part of the family-based treatment approach. And so I wasn't ever really allowed to be having what I would want to have, which was as little as possible. But no, it was never like, I want to have that, but no, I shouldn't. It was this, I just, if I could have my way growing up, it was like, I would just not have wanted to eat at all. And then when it became my own responsibility, like once you phase out of the pediatric system, it's suddenly on you. It's okay. If you want treatment, then you go in as an adult. And if you can't adhere to whatever the rules are of the program, then you're out because there's so many people who, who need those beds. And so it, what ended up happening was, again, I went out on my own. I managed to, I would have a meal plan for myself. So I'd be like, okay, I'm going to make sure that I eat this many calories per day. And it was okay. Like I want to make sure I don't fall into that zone where I'll get flagged or something going to university, going through medical training. There was always like strings attached and I never wanted it to be like evident to other people that I was sick. And then it was when I got to residency that was no longer there. It was like, okay, wow, somehow <laughs> they let me all the way through. I've gotten here. And I didn't really mean to. I started having less and I was losing more weight. And I think that's maybe when I started to feel like my body was just exhausted. And it was really hard for me to admit that to myself or acknowledge mm -hmm. that because mm -hmm. it was like, look, I'm still going to work every day. I'm still doing all of these things. But that was maybe when I realized maybe it was things like I was hungry, but I just, even at that point, like the idea of eating was so terrifying to me. Like I had to like weigh everything like to the ground. I was like, looking back at that now, I felt so stuck. Like it was just so terrifying. And that's shifted a lot. Like I think it's just I, a bit remarkable to me thinking mm -hmm. about where I was at that point. I still, food is not something I enjoy. It's something I make myself eat, but I'm actually able to do that. Mm. Whereas that was unthinkable before. So how many, from the age of seven to when you were out on your own, how many years were that? Was that? Yeah. So I guess like when I was like 17, back to 18 was when I went off to like undergrad. And when I went to university at that point, it was still, I had to like keep up some degree of I would go to I would go to therapy and I would see a doctor and it was all but it was for other people it wasn't for myself it was really only I think probably around 2019 like when I started residency when it really shifted and I started to realize okay this is a problem it's not I always was like the treatment was the problem like I was just so mad I was like that is the issue that me having an eating disorder not a problem but that really changed yeah kind of 2019 2020 so it sounds like a lot of the reluctance, admitting to yourself that you're sick is hard in itself. I think most of us, when it comes to mental health, we don't want to admit that we need help. That goes without saying. But I think eating disorders are a lot more complex, I imagine. But it also sounds like there's an element of that is clearly not going to help me. I don't want that. That is not what I want. And I don't want to even admit that is something helpful because it doesn't look right. It doesn't feel right. I can see people who are experiencing this treatment, so to speak goes against what they are as a person. It violates their sense of self. It's like force feeding and things like that. This sounds very intrusive. And as, I guess so, to be soft about it. Yeah. I mean, this, I struggle with it because I don't want to just bash that treatment. I think as much, it gets hard for me to say this. I think there are people out there that it does maybe help and that they say often, if it's somebody like a younger person and it's like very early in the trajectory of them becoming ill that it can be helpful for them to have their parents take over and, mm -hmm. and just do the feeding for them. And then they come back into it. But I think, again, everyone is so different. And I really taking like a one size fits all approach just in general, whether it's English or whether it's anything, is where it starts to go wrong. And often when people who are not in like the eating disorder treatment world hear about it, they're like, 
oh my God, what is that? It's, it mm. seems very, yeah, like you said, intrusive and not doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, but that's the prevailing philosophy in, in that field. What was your relationship like with your parents at that time? And who did you consider to be close to you at that time? Friends, family, siblings? So I guess this was part of the struggle. Like when I was growing up and when I was in the, the outpatient treatment, I withdrew. Like I wasn't allowed because I, I was never any gush at them, but I really liked like sports and I, I liked playing tennis and swimming. And part of it was always restricting the amount of activity because then it was, you know, seeing, oh, like you're burning more calories, you have to eat more. So I, and it was also really, things were okay up until they started to get better. When I started high school, my parents eased back a bit and but then I think I got to like grade 11 or grade 10. And then I suddenly got into this other outpatient program. And it was like, again, very, very much controlled. And they made me like gain weight again. And I ended up withdrawing again from my friends. I just, I didn't feel like I could, I was just so ashamed. And it's not, it wasn't just like appearance. Like it just felt physically, like it was mm -hmm. very, Again, this is where I think there's that interplay, at least for me, between the obsessive compulsive disorder and the eating disorder. I just felt so uncomfortable in my own skin. I couldn't be around other people. And then with my parents, my mom was always the one. I lived with my mom and my stepdad. So she was always the one who was more kind of in charge of the food. And so I took out a lot of the anger on her too. My dad, I'd see him once a week. He started to then get more involved in the treatment. That's that repeat round like in, in high school and ultimately I think my relationship with him always stayed a little bit closer because for some reason I always blamed my mom a lot more and it, it got to the point actually like in grade 12 I I had had it and I ended up you know, my mom and I will tell her like I was asked to leave versus I left and then I ended up moving in with my dad and that was the first time I'd ever really lived with him and at that point, it was nice because he gave me more freedom to do what I wanted. And what I wanted was to not eat. And so I lost weight again. And then I ended up being hospitalized again. And that was like a, one of the worst ones because I went straight from this like inpatient to day hospital. And they, by that point, said, look, you're treatment resistant. So we're just going to make you gain a ton of weight because we know, and again, this is the thought behind it was you're going to lose it anyway. So we're just going to get you as high as we can and like basically hammer you with the treatment. Mm -hmm. And to me, it was like, okay, if the same thing isn't working, don't just keep doing it and doing it more intensely. Let's try something else. But yeah, so that, that was a, one of the worst experiences I had. And at that point, like it ended up being like, I only looking back, I didn't really, I wish I had run away for a whole, I blame myself for not running away. I was for some reason, I was like, I really wanted to finish high school and like graduate. And so that was the, the punishment was, okay, we won't be allowed to go back to school if you don't do this program. And yeah, so that I had a very poor relationship with my parents at that point. And then it only really started to heal once I left home. And yeah, by the time I had gotten to residency, it's, it was a lot better. And I trusted that they couldn't do anything to me anymore they couldn't force me into treatment they, I was an adult so yeah we were a lot closer and I, I had friends at school and I just had a lot more of my life back it's it's tricky right because at that age and I remember being a teenager it's all about finding your own way even if you're wrong you're not going to admit you're wrong right because you are still at the center of the universe in some ways so in, in some ways a lot of your story is like <laughs> what every one of us experiences being a stubborn snotty-nosed teenager, right? On the other hand, you had this other thing that you were trying to figure out. And so at what point, when you said you, it started to heal when you came back after being away for a few years or doing your own thing for a few years, how do you think your parents, or your dad in particular, look at that period of time at now, looking back at that particular time? I'm, we're, it sounds like you're all, you're both wiser and you've learned a lot from it, grown a lot from it, and accepted a lot from it. How do you look back at that time now, you and your dad? And this is the part where I guess it, it gets more complicated again because they did step back. And I think at the time, though, they were still very worried. And because I was, it, there was always that worry for them that they would rather I was 
at like a healthy or normal or more normal way. But they saw that I was doing all the things I wanted to do. I was able to travel, able to be in school. And so it was, I guess, just uneasy. It's good. Let's wait and see. Let's watch. But I think they were still very worried. And so that was, I was, oh, they, they seemed the error of their ways. Look, I'm doing my own thing. Mm. And that was why it was especially tough, I think, when it happened again. But as an adult, that they forced me into treatment. But yeah, I think now it should really see him. That is not help, a helpful approach. And I think they've had their own journeys and they've really come to accept at the end of the day. They've done everything they can to help me and none of this is their fault. And yeah, whatever happens to me now at this point, it's, it's my responsibility. A lot of it also comes back to, I think, eating disorders are not understood well. A lot of it, at least from the layman like me, it comes down to maybe, why wouldn't the person eat? It just boggles people's minds. Like, you're hungry, you eat. Yeah. Why wouldn't you eat? I think it's a fundamental misunderstanding, underappreciation of the complexity of it and the experiential nature of it. What do you think most people misunderstand or don't consider when they think of eating disorders? It's not about, it's not about food and it's not about weight. Like, I think that is like fundamentally, it's just, as with, I think, and this is why I do think that eating disorders are similar in a lot of ways to other substance use disorders or other compulsive behaviors, like you mentioned, where the not eating, or for some people who have, say, binge eating disorder or the over, whatever it is, it's a coping mechanism that somewhere along the way, when I was a kid, for whatever reason, to me, it was like not eating made me feel safe. It was dealing with something. Mm. And so, in, instead of trying to just correct that behavior, it doesn't get at the underlying issues. Well, sure, you can make someone gain weight and send them back out again. And until you deal with or find another way to deal with whatever it was that was helping you deal with, you're not going to really be able to heal. And so, again, I can't speak for everyone. I just, I know for me that it was never about the food. It was not about weight. It was something. And I'm still not entirely sure what it is. All I do know is that now I was able to eventually recognize that with a lot of help uh, that it wasn't serving me anymore. Maybe it was at some And I think the other part maybe that I guess I'll jump to is that I think it's common, especially with in, in youth, that they like to frame the eating disorder, demonize it almost, treat it as like this external monster that has taken over your child to help parents because it's really frustrating. Yeah. The number of times that you hear and not understanding. And I was generally a pretty like quiet, like non obtrusive child when they were trying to force me to eat. Like I, I was like throwing dishware and screaming and had security called on me. It was not me. So I can understand times that might help parents to not be angry at their child. And at the same time, for me, it's it was very difficult. Even now, like I think I'm not angry at the part of me that had the eating disorder or that behavior because I think it was protecting me from something and it was helping me. And it was just learning to now say like, it's okay. I can find other ways to deal with this. Thank you for what you did. And then letting that go. Stepping into Putting the conventional psychiatrist hat on because you are in your fourth year, you're soon going to be practicing. How does conventional psychiatry see things like eating disorders? What is the definition? And from that, what are the range of treatments that are applied or available? Sounds like you've experienced a, quite, a few different types of treatments, whether effective or not. What are the sort of, what, are the, what is the underlying premise behind these treatments? What do they think is going on? Yeah. And I'll preface this by saying that, unfortunately, in psychiatry training and medical training, we do not get very much training at all in eating disorders. I think it's starting to shift, but really it's if you choose to go do electives in it or seek out more of that, that exposure yourself, that's where most people would get it from. It's in, like even now, if somebody with an eating disorder is trying to seek help, there are many psychiatrists because, you know, the lack of training, they just say, sorry, I don't feel comfortable treating eating disorders, which is really challenging and frustrating. It's, it's just 
I think what, that, what do you think that is? Is it, the medical- is it because there's not enough cases that have been studied? Is it because it's prevalent in what I imagine maybe more prevalent in women? Or is it not enough data? What is it? What is the discomfort behind not wanting to treat? And I can totally like understand. I think part of it is that complexity, the medical complexity piece, because if somebody is really in, a, in an unstable place medically, it's a whole lot more added liability for someone to be trying to help them. And when you don't know if their heart's going to stop beating in the middle of the night, it's a very scary place to be in as a treatment provider. And I think as well, the lack of actual training, I think the lack of understanding of or lack of real treatments out there when it comes to eating disorders, there's the typical classification that we have, which is anorexia nervosa, which is where people are generally restricting and then bulimia nervosa where people binge and purge. And often in psychiatry, we approach things from when it comes to treatment, thinking about biological treatment, so medications. And there aren't really any medications to treat, say, anorexia nervosa. There's medications that people may be on to treat comorbid conditions, whether it's depression, anxiety. But at the end of the day, like, but then we think shift from biological, think about psychological treatments, therapies. There's especially in youth, family-based treatment is the, or the Maudsley method. It's where the, they have parents take over. But again, that doesn't work for everyone. Not everyone has the standard family structure around them to support them. And so we are at a loss. And I think part of, and maybe this is more broadly in psychiatry, the issue is that we really silo things. So even somebody trying to get treatment for, say, a substance use disorder who has an eating disorder may be rejected from a program because of their eating disorder, mm. because of the added like medical complexity. Somebody with depression or anxiety may not be able to participate in a program because of the eating disorder. Eating disorder may not be able to participate in a trauma program because of it. So we have all of these silos when ultimately with many of these, they, the reason there's so much comorbidity is because there's that underlying issue, whatever it may be. And our whole diagnostic system, like the DSM, is based on clusters of symptoms, not underlying Mm. pathophysiology. It's like saying to someone, oh, like instead of depression, you have pain. That doesn't really tell us anything, but we treat it as though everyone with eating disorder is going to have the same reason and should be treated the same way. And I think that's where Again, this, I think this is where psychedelics are really helpful. They help us kind of get to those underlying issues and help empower people then to be able to have a greater understanding of that and then move towards healing. Beautifully said. And it's a great segue because from what you shared with me previously is that breakthrough did come eventually with plant medicine and particularly with ayahuasca. And I think what's really beautiful about what you described before is you experiencing ayahuasca and going through the medicine, but with your dad. And both of you decided to go together. And Sanjay was on the podcast previously, and he described that the before, during, and after from his perspective. I'd love to know, how did you come to a place where you thought, okay, I'm going to go do this with my dad? Because both of you found out about psychedelics. I think he found out about it first through Robin Carter Harris, who is obviously a celebrated pioneer in this space, and then you got to find out about it. But I think you would only be open to it, I imagine, if you had accepted that there's something that you need to do about this, that you have to try something else. So maybe describe to us what that period of your life was like. How did you and Sanjay decide that, okay, we want to do this together? What was the intention behind it? And then we'll talk about the during and the after. Yeah. So even thinking back to that time, so that was, again, like 2019, I set off to go start my residency. And I was actually, I guess, through undergrad medical school, I had lived with roommates, but I came back on weekends a lot. And so this was my first time. Like I moved downtown. I had my own condo, no roommates. And I was really like more on my own than I had ever been before. And it wasn't really intentional, but it was also like I was no longer having to put on this performance. I didn't have to like stay at a certain weight to pass as being healthy or normal. And so it just over the course of that beginning of residency, I was having an amazing time. I loved what I was doing. And I just 
losing weight. And it, I, it got to the point, I think it was by around like January, February. And like, I was just randomly having panic attacks, like on the TTC, like on the subway. And I never had panic attacks before. I didn't know what was going on. I, I would just wake up and I, I, I just don't want to keep going. I wasn't actively wanting to end my life. It was just, I was so tired. Mm. And to me, like stopping school or taking a break or saying like anything like to other people to signal that I was not okay was not an option. It was just, I just have to wake up, keep going, go to sleep. Hope I don't wake up. Oh, I woke up again. And I was just in this like really dark place. And all of this. So my dad, I think, introduced me to psychedelics the year before when he had first heard about it. And so I'd had a couple of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy experiences. And that was really like life-changing for me. Like it was the first time I was able, I remember the first session I had, I was able to look in a mirror and not hate myself. And mm. not just how I look, but just not hate myself as a person. And that, so that, that was really powerful, but it still wasn't enough to stop this like trajectory. I was still going down. And so by, it was I think it was February we had planned. And actually my mom was really involved by this point too. And she was like new to all of this as well. And so it was actually the three of us. And then we had some amazing, very supportive people who made this happen for us that we were able to go and do like a five day, like of ayahuasca ceremonies. I didn't make it like all five days. I think I only did three nights, but it was just this last, last ditch effort. And I went into it like, I don't know, I had nothing else to lose at this point. Like, I didn't know what to expect. But what ended up happening was during it, I, the first night, I had seen nothing happened to me, really. I was sitting there for six to eight hours. My dad was just like, <laughs> like having his dragon experience. And then my mom was having her own thing and like throwing up and they're all puking. And I was just like lying there, like something wrong, like it didn't work. And then I think it was like afterwards that we all went back, like back to our rooms to sleep. And then something just hit me and was like much later. Mm. But then I was like, oh my God, what is happening? Mm. And it was really like terrifying and awful. And I remember like during it, I was like, oh my God, what am I doing? I'm never doing this ever again. What was I thinking? And, and then I like went into this period where I was like laughing hysterically and I was like I love Iowa (laughs) and they were they were like and then I don't know what happened but somehow I don't know and the nights are glory together but it's like one of those nights that had happened and then the following day I just I had seen myself like in the middle of this storm like I was just like there all alone in the middle of this crazy like clouds and lightning and I just saw I was like you need help I don't know. I like, I finally just got it that what does it matter if you're not, if you're dead? Like, it, it, isn't it better to take a step back, take a week off work or something? Like, just try to help yourself a little bit. And mm. so I ended up, I was, I was just, I guess, in this place. So I was like, okay, so maybe I do need help, but there is like, where do I go? I'm not going into back into another inpatient treatment program I just that doesn't work for me we ended up and again like I am incredibly fortunate like my dad and my mom and all these people like made this happen that I was able to get transferred to this like acute eating sort of like this facility in Denver basically like we flew out there and I I was very scared to go there because I was like I don't want this to be another experience where it's going to be like it's going to be on my term they're not going to force me to eat whatever their foods are like I will make myself gain weight with it like I have very restricted things I was going to eat I was like I'll have protein powder and that's it but like I'll have as much of it as I need to and I ended up getting there and this was right at the time of COVID too so I think it was probably one of the last flights where they were like letting people like go out of Canada and my parents had initially planned to come and like bring me into the hospital they weren't allowed in so I went in that first night there, like they took my blood sugar level and it was like low. And it was like all I had eaten probably for the past 24 hours is like a banana on the plane. So it's understandable that it's low. So, okay, if we're going to have dinner or something now, I'll have that. They wanted me to drink a cup of juice. 
And again, this is for my stubbornness. Like, and I just, I was like, I'm not drinking juice to me. Like sugar was very mm. scary. And I had already had this like banana. I was like, no, I'm not having juice. Like give me anything else. They wouldn't. We got into this. I think it's, again, it's like, I can see how a lot of times it's people are frustrated treating people with eating disorders because it's like, why the hell can you not drink this mm. juice? Like your blood sugar is low. But to me, it was just so terrifying. So then I decided, like, I was there for the night. I was like hooked up to all these monitors. I was like, this is awful. I want to leave. So the next day I called my parents who were like staying in a hotel, like they next door. I was like, okay, I'm done. I want to go home. They were like, okay, you've been there one day. Give it a chance. I was totally done with it. And again, I don't think it was intentional, like the staff working there, but it was just very, it did not feel good. It felt, again, very, you're being forced, you're being controlled. And mm, to me, that was mm. like the scariest thing in the world. And and I decided I was going to leave. So I tried to grab my passport, my coat, my things, and they called security. They ended up certifying me, actually. And I did not know the law in Colorado. Here in Ontario, when you certify someone, it's initially like a 72-hour hold for like up to two weeks for the first one. Does that mean? Oh, so sorry. Yeah. So basically, when you feel someone is a danger to themselves or a danger to others or unable to care for themselves and they need psychiatric assessment, here in Ontario, we call it like a Form 1. You put somebody on a form and basically you involuntarily can detain them until they're assessed. And so that's like for 72 hours. And so that's the same in Denver. But the difference is that after that 72 hour period in Ontario, if you decide, okay, this person is a danger to themselves or others or can't care for themselves, you can put them on another form, which allows you to hospitalize them for two weeks, the initial form. And then you can extend that. There's different, you know, paths that can go from there. But in, in Colorado, little did I know, the initial form is 72 hours. The next one is three months. Oh, wow. So I ended up being certified in Denver for three months. And this is something I don't think any, and like I've never talked to any of my co-residents about it because for me, it's still something very, when I'm on call in the psych emerge, we're certifying people. And every mm. time I'm just, I think back to what it was like to have that happen. And that like feeling when it's, you suddenly realize like you literally cannot walk out of the room. And Do you need a guardian to help? I guess at that point, you're not a guardian because you're legally an adult. Only an institution can certify. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, you're in a, like a psychiatric facility mm. and you have the right to challenge it. And so I did, I, I went through this hearing, but it mm. was not, it was not real. It was basically, they said, this person does not want mm. to eat. They're not capable of making their decisions. And anyway, I, so I ended up there. My parents were so scared, mm. I think, because, I, and I, I can see why they were very scared, like looking at how I was from a medical perspective, but I was so angry for them because they they agreed to keep me there for three months. And again, when we think about insurers, often some of the things we learn are things they it comes from this feeling of a lack of control or and so the treatment being to like overly control someone and restrict them further, it just mm. did not make sense to me. But anyway, I ended up at the end of towards the end of the three months they wanted to extend it for another period of several months but my parents by that point saw that I it was not helpful in any way it was more damaging than anything else and so I did end up coming back my program was so my residency program was so incredibly supportive they all was like I didn't tell them what was going on exactly but they knew I was like on a medical leave and so I, I was fortunate and then I was able to when I came back to Toronto, it was around June. It was all still during COVID. So everything was very weird anyway. So it helped a bit that I wasn't having to go into work every day and see. There was a quite a period when I came back where I was just like, and because they had made me gain weight again, I felt so uncomfortable and I just, I couldn't really see myself continuing to live. But eventually, like I was able to, moved past it. I got back, started up in my program again, and I did end up like losing weight again. And But I was able to keep going. That was like all through, I guess, 2020. By like towards the end of 2021, I was in a not, like my weight started sliding again. And this was where I think it was really 
tough for me to admit as well, because I was so against, okay, that treatment did not help me, but I also wasn't able to do it on my own. But in that interim, like from when I came out of Denver, I had other experience. I had done more MDMA assisted therapy. I had done psilocybin assisted psychotherapy. I did there's 5 meo DMT, ketamine. And I was, again, very lucky that my dad and my mom and, and that we had supports around us to get me all that. I don't know what ultimately did flip. I think it was accumulation of all of this, but, and then I was able to actually get like internal family systems or IFS therapy and together, like all of something shifted. And then by, I guess it would have been like a year and a half ago now, like the end or very beginning of 2022, like last year, I started to just be able to gain weight on Mm. my own. Like I, and I'm at this weird place now where, again, like I look back and before it was just like, literally, if you had put something in front of me, if I couldn't weigh it or add the calories, like I would just vastly overestimate the calories in it. I would not eat anything unless I knew like exactly what was in it. And now it's still, I still have a lot of odd, I'll still only eat limited types of foods, but like I was able to finally make myself eat the amount that I needed to gain weight. And as uncomfortable as I still feel, like it's not by any means that I'm totally better. There's times where I'm like actually angry. Like why I wish I had it back. I was like, because it felt so Mm. safe to be that way, even if it meant that I could die. But I'm st- I'm in this place now where it's am lucky that I am still alive, and I think I'm going to find eventually like that place where I can be comfortable and happy. But yeah, it's been sorry that was a no, long that's, kind of that's yeah, super. Well, but... Thank you so much. I'm really grateful that you shared this crazy journey so far, all the learnings and transformations that come from it. I'm curious. You said a few times that the eating disorder for you at least, stem from the need for control. And when I think, when I hear control, it's the need for certainty. And certainty for what reason? Certainty to feel safe or to know what's going on or to where you are, your surroundings and what is coming after and things like that. I'm speculating, of course, I, I don't know. But from that perspective, meaning the need for certainty, the need for control, And having gone through a range of experiences with psychedelics, with therapy, what shifted in terms of the need for control, you think? Even looking at the food and being able to judge differently or to see it differently, what do you think shifted? I'm still trying to figure that out. I think what it came to was just this realization. And it sounds so... It sounds ridiculous when I say it because it's like, why couldn't you just realize that earlier? But it was just so inconsequential, so insignificant. It's, if I right now were to go and eat a strawberry, who cares mm. if it's 20 calories or five calories or at the end of the day, I think it's it just something in my head. It's which and it was like you like it was buried before it was like safe and predictable it was like okay even if I feel all full and exhausted and tired it was just at least it was like this routine it was what I knew and it was in that way it was very safe and I think I just became fed up with not having the energy anymore to do things that I loved to do and I really love to travel and I love to walk around and it was even things like at the hospital when I'm at work, I was like taking the stairs because one, the elevators are forever like getting broken and stuck. Mm-hmm. But I got to the point where I was like so exhausted. I was like, I just had to take the elevator. And that for me was like, what am I doing? Like I, there's other things more important. And I guess I'm not sure where the control really shifted, but it was being able to have, I think, that openness and Again, I think that is due in large part to the psychedelic assisted therapy and all of that work. But before it was like, even though I realized that there were things that were more important, I just wasn't able to change my behavior. It was too rigid, mm-hmm. too stuck. So what it sounds like, at least to me, is it's not like you didn't see what was on the other side before. You saw it. But because you felt trapped in it, it further debilitated you. 
I can't escape my own circumstances. Even I do, I know I would be happier on the other side. And I can imagine that sort of like almost spirals and makes it worse because now you're like, okay, you're subject and the very thing you want control, you're actually giving up control. It's like, it's, yeah, it sounds really like a infinite loop. And what may have happened, just going off what you said, is that you were able to see the other side still, but feel secure enough in taking the leap and go, if I don't, I need to try something. And you let yourself do it. Is that right? Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. How do you, when did you first decide that something had shifted and you were doing things different? Like, when did you give yourself the credit to go, you know what? I took a leap and it was worth it. And I did something. And it's, I'm not there yet, but I'm doing something different. I can feel something change. It probably would have been around, yeah, like January or February mm. of last year. And again, it's, this sounds weird, but it didn't feel good. And it still doesn't feel good because, in many ways, I was always able to, when I had to gain weight or it, it was always, I was blaming it, like somebody else was forcing me to do it. So now if I can't be mad at it, I'm doing this to myself. <laughs> right. And so every time I really, it, it's, it would be, a, feel a lot more comfortable and safe to go back to how things were, but something is stopping me from doing mm. that. And I often find like, it's not important to know what the answer is. Sometimes maybe knowing that it worked or something's changed and you are you can be yourself is enough because whether you come back come from a perspective of science and psychiatry or experience ultimately just having a sense that you are no longer a psychic prisoner of your own mind can be really powerful i want to pull out a quote from an interview you did that i think is it really speaks to what may be your approach or motivation for becoming a psychiatrist and the work you hope to be doing. And the quote is, recognizing patients as the experts in their own experience and appreciating the vast wealth of insight they bring to the table is crucial. My hope is that we can bridge the gap between us and them in the healthcare system. We are all human beings who may fall ill ourselves at some point, and this is not a weakness or flaw on our part. In what ways do you think conventional psychiatry is ill-equipped or has been ill-equipped. Because psychiatry, on some levels, I find even with psychology and understandings of the mind, it feels super outdated. And I understand nothing can exist in a vacuum, but in what ways do you feel like conventional psychiatry is ill-equipped to handle things like eating disorders? But on the other hand, having gone through experience, knowing about psych psychedelics, all the other sort of alternative treatments, what gives you hope? I think this is where we are in a really exciting and promising time because in the past, even a few years ago, I would have been terrified to say anything or acknowledge having a psychiatric illness myself and in a way that could be seen or picked up by in my professional spheres. And I think it's exciting to see that within, within our department across the board really like in in medicine and now increasingly in psychiatry there are groups being developed advisory groups of people with lived experience mm. with mental illness themselves or their families and it's not just this token we have this like people are actually listening and i think increasingly recognizing that in many ways like what we're doing now isn't working let's ask the people who are on the receiving end of the care, what would be helpful to them? And I am really heartened to see that. And I think that it's not just clinically, I think even in research, more and more people are being consulted as having expertise. That's different. People go through training, whether it's to become a psychologist, psychiatrist, they get a degree and you do. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of studying and knowledge that people gain. And that is very different than the experiential knowledge of somebody with an illness. And so I think we need to be able to bring all of that together in order to provide that individualized care that people need. It's not just about what does the research show us or what do generally studies show us because everyone is different. And so that does give me hope that more and more there is this shift towards that. And 
again, I touched on this, but I know there are the ways in which with psychiatry that I, it, we struggle is because, again, our whole diagnostic classification system is based on clusters of symptoms, not underlying the roots of it. And so as we start to more and more understand trauma, especially how that is so intrinsically linked, not just to psychiatric illnesses, to, to physical illnesses, and more and more that's being highlighted. There's the adverse childhood experiences or like the ACEs, and there's more light being shed on how that can lead to health problems for people. And so, again, as we start to embrace different types of therapy and really appreciating, I think there's a role for biological and understanding things from the neurons and the disorders like actually structurally in the brain and also take into account like the social factors in someone's life and cultural and psychological and all of that coming together. It makes us a lot better equipped to mm. treat people no matter what illness or box category they fall into. It's just treating a person and seeing whether it's an injury or whether it's an addiction, like those are maybe coping strategies they've come to, to develop not in themselves the problem. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes total sense. Do you think there's an there's increasing attention on at least let's say compulsive behaviors or eating disorders in particular because of things like technology addiction? There's a lot of research that is talking about what is the implications for me, of media and its influence on let's say young women and their sort of image of themselves, low self-esteem, which can, as I understand, lead to things like eating disorders or any anorexia and so on. Do you feel like there's an increasing amount of appreciation or attention on something like eating disorders? And if so, how do we understand eating disorders differently now than, let's say, 10 years ago? What is the emerging sort of understanding of frameworks? Yeah, I think for sure that awareness out there that the media can contribute. And I think this is where, again, we can run into difficulties because it's multifactorial. It, there's always multiple things going on. It's not necessarily that somebody will see a model on TV and then think, I want to look like that and develop an issue. There's all of these underlying predisposing factors and potential triggers. And so I worry that we over can oversimplify things at times. I think it's really important that there is I think there is more attention on especially coming out of COVID mm. there was a real spike especially among young people and it really highlighted some of especially I think eating disorders were in, in the news a lot more I worry that sometimes the way that it's portrayed as there is this link and of course I think it can contribute social media and people filtering themselves and changing themselves can definitely maybe influence someone and I think it also can make it a little bit tougher at times because then it almost frames it as it's more of this like a choice it's oh vanity or they want to look like this whereas at the end of the day it's not just about wanting to look thin or attractive at least I know for me when I was like sick very sick like I knew it was not attractive it was, but it was not about the way I looked to anyone else it was just I was so terrified to be mm. any different so I think in some way, good to get more attention, good to get more focus on trying to treat things. And we have to be careful about overgeneralizing or, or stereotyping. If you had to bring it all together and say what things could be done better, what would that be? And I'm asking, as you described your experience and coming back to the notion of control and security, Gaur Mate always frequently talks about every person having this fundamental need for both authenticity and attachment or security. Uh, and maybe part of the challenge is that most medical conditions, or at least from conventional medicine, psychiatry and whatever, you're meant, they're, it's meant to look at only the symptoms in a very compartmentalized sense. And instead of looking at holistically, how does one thing affect a whole web of stuff? Are there is there a different way of looking at eating something like eating disorders, whether as an eating disorder or as an umbrella under an umbrella of other things that is fundamental to the human need that could help alleviate suffering? I think, and again, this is like a broad term that gets used a lot. I think though it really comes back to trauma 
also, as Dr. Mate says, trauma is mm -hmm. not what happened to you. It's not about necessarily the thing. It's about how the individual person responds. And I think that's where, again, not just eating disorders, all kinds of things that people struggle with. If we could shift in the idea where it's more of a system where we really try to understand people's stories and what their pain is and how they are coping with it and then helping them find another way or to really to look underneath though and to dig down to what's underlying it. And again, not necessarily a specific event or, but it's the emotions that are there. And then using that as the way to guide how we treat people, I think that could really help. And I think it gives me a lot of hope because right now there are, unfortunately, there are many people with eating disorders who feel so stuck and lost and hopeless because like you said, you're like stuck in this prison of your own mind and just knowing that it's possible, whether it's through psychedelic assisted therapy or other approaches that we're going to try and explore more, that there is the possibility that some of that could relax a bit and you could find a different way. It gives me a lot of hope and I hope that it gives others hope too. It's such an inspiring story, Nikita, and I really appreciate again you taking us through like the crazy journey you've had so far. And I'm sure the work doesn't end for any of us, really. The work continues. And maybe that's where both like the beauty and the 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 ongoing cycle of suffering and liberation is in life. I think I, this is going to, this is such an inspir inspiring sort of story in, in every sense of the word, not only in terms of like how you, the things that you've gone through, but how you look at it back now. And then I assume I can imagine how much healing it's taken for you to get to this point, not just for yourself, but for your relationships with your parents and so on. I, imagine that you were speaking directly to people or an individual who, let's say, hasn't gone through what you've gone through so far, or they're struggling with whatever condition, what would you say to them to help them? I don't want to come at this from too, I guess, much of a self-centered perspective. I know what maybe I would have wanted to hear. And so I, I hope that this will help people just knowing that it's okay that you want to give up or that you don't see any way to keep going and it's okay to be tired and it's okay. It's just, it's okay. You don't need to constantly keep fighting and struggling. And at the same time, there is hope and you don't need to try these new routes and you don't, nobody needs to force you to do those things. However, there are alternatives out there and I never would have imagined being in the place I am now, even a couple of years ago. And I am, as much as it's been challenging and it's still difficult, I am very grateful that, that I was able to explore some of these alternative therapies. And yeah, at the end of the day, it's up to you and you can choose. And there is hope if you feel that you have the capacity to keep and, and moving toward it. Amazing. Nikki, thank you so much. What's really amazing is that you are now on the inside, someone with lived experience who is fighting to make the thing better. I always feel that ultimately, if you center everything on the human experience, there is always reason for hope. And you're certainly there and I'm rooting for you. I'm very excited for you and the future ahead. Thank you so much for sharing your life and journey. Thank you for the incredibly kind words and for having me here. I honestly, it's a true honor and a privilege. This podcast was brought to life with the help of Carolyn Tripp on art and design. Thanks so much for listening to Minority Trip Report. If you're learning from or enjoying the podcast, please subscribe to MTR on YouTube at Minority Trip Report and follow us on Instagram at Minority Trip. It's a zero cost way to support us and help us spread the word. Please also sign up with your email for new episode announcements, events, as well as our forthcoming newsletter. I'm your host, Rod Suraj. See you next time.